Good afternoon. This is the Thurston County Board of Health for May 8, 2018. I'm Commissioner Bud Blake, Chair of the Board this year. I'd like to start off by doing a few introductions. To my right is Commissioner John Hutchings. To his right is Lydia, Lydia Hodgkinson, the Clerk of the Board. To her right is Shelley Slaughter, Director of Public Health and Social Services. To her right is Dr. Wood, the Health Officer for Thurston and Lewis County. And to her right is Ramirez Chavez, County Manager. With that, I'll call the meeting to order. And I'll ask if there's a motion to approve today's agenda. I move to approve the agenda for uh, Board of Health for uh, May. What are we, May? Eighth, 2018. Thank there you. you go. Second, it's been moved, moved and seconded uh, to approve the agenda for May 8, 2018. All those in favor say aye. 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 And that motion carries. Well, today we have an exciting lineup of uh, proclamations, and we start off today with Drinking Water Week. And that's absolutely wonderful because of the way we're going into the summer months, spring and summer months. It's good to be able to talk about uh, the drinking water we have here in Thurston County. And I've asked Mr. Art Starry, there he is, I knew he was here somewhere, he <laughs> snuck up on me there, to give us a little bit of background and where we're at as far as that and uh, <coughs> accept the proclamation. Hi, Art, how are you doing there? Pretty good, how are you? Uh, so I'm Art Starry. I'm the Environmental Health Division Director for Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. And I'm very pleased today that you are recognizing this as Drinking Water Week. Uh, as you know, and I'm sure a lot of the folks who watch this show or, or deal with public or environmental health realize that that's, you know, safe water, it's really most of what we do in environmental health. You know, there's safe food, there's other things, but if you look at a lot of the programs that we have, uh, a lot of our emphasis is having, working to make sure that we have safe, reliable water supplies or drinking water supplies for the residents of Thurston County. And um, again, it's obvious why we'd want to do that. You can't live without water. And if you have clean and safe water, you live much better than if you, than if you don't. And it helps deal with economic pros prosperity. It makes our lives much easier. There's, there's lots of reasons why that's important. And I was actually just at a meeting uh, across the parking lot over at the Red Lion where they were talking a bit about drinking water stuff. And I, it struck me just how fortunate we are in the county. We've got very bountiful, abundant resources that are well managed. But if you think about the world population, there's two billion people who don't have safe, even really any water supplies at all. And so it puts that in perspective. That's over a quarter of the world's population doesn't have anything close to what we have here in Thurston County. So we're very fortunate. Um, so today, what we wanted to do, uh, we've got many, many partners in the community who are helping us, yeah. and by saying us, us protect public health, um, by yeah. managing water supplies, by, by managing land use and properties so that, that we're protecting our water resources. We wanted to recognize one of them. I mean, there's, we could pack the room full of folks today from the cities to the different water supply operators, but, but today we have the Thurston County PUD. Yay. So we have Chris Stearns, who's the president of the board of the Thurston County PUD, and he's got a couple of his staff here. And so uh, we, again, we wanted to recognize them. Uh, we really appreciate the work that they do. Uh, they've operate, I think, over 300 water supplies, many of them in Thurston County. They do a very good job. Uh, I know that when we have, when problems <laughs> come up with their water supplies, and it doesn't happen very often, but we always appreciate it when we know that they're operating them because they're very responsible and they take care of things quickly and professionally and appropriately. So we really do appreciate working with them and their partnership and the quality services they provide to the community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chris if you'd like to say something. Hey. Hello there, Chris. How are you doing? How are you guys it's doing today? To see no. How's drinking water in the PUD? Well, we moved into a new headquarters over in Lacey near, uh, over, uh, near the St. Martin's Pavilion area on the north end of Ruddle Road. Uh, Mr. Alf's former law offices, if you remember Mr. Alf, uh, who passed away a few years ago. Anyway, um, we're now doubled in size. This all happened coincidentally. Uh, doubled in size, and uh, so we have a lot more staff that we inherited from H&R, one of which is sitting to my left here, Jim Campbell, who's now Chief of Operations, and I have with me Anthony, who's one of our own staff that, you know, we merge staff, obviously. Sure. So uh, we're working towards uh, trying to give better service and learn the systems that we have and make sure that the staff we've acquired learn our system so that's what we're in the process of doing in this first year after the merger and uh, just introduce you guys and stand up and yeah hello Jim Anthony how you doing there? and 
guess that's all I have to say. It was great to see you recognize this. And, so give us a little bit about how many wells and pumps and how the PU works as far as the entire... <clears throat> well, when he mentioned 300 systems, I know a few people's eyes widened with that. Um, we are the PUD known for having the most Group B systems. What a Group B system is, is one that operates with less than 15 connections or not a restaurant, for example, um, where you have a lot of people coming through, so that's why they're considered a Group A system. Um, and with Group Bs, they're small, decentralized, and spread throughout the unincorporated areas, which, of course, you folks are the primary uh, people responsible for the tax and every other aspect of being in the unincorporated county where I live too, by the way. Um, so I, I just want to mention that that's an important role. We've grown in size. Uh, one of the biggest systems we had originally, and this goes back to the 50s, was Tanglewild. It's still our largest system, but we have acquired many others and uh, we're also in the process at the end of June of getting uh, out of Mason County. So we're turning those systems with a negotiated agreement over to Mason PUD-1. So we're reducing some of our footprint outside of the county and concentrating more inside the county. About 70 to 75% of our systems are inside Thurston County. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. Any questions or comments? Over there? Yeah, you know the old adage, uh, you don't know what you have or have it so good until it's gone. Well, it's also a new adage. It's still current because in uh, March I was in uh, China for 19 days. Everything, everything, even in the restaurants you attend, uh, uh, is bottled water. Bottled water. You can't that's drink right. the water. You cannot drink the water. And it was, it, it, it was, wow. I did. Then you get home and it's uh, eat right from the tap. You just mm -hmm. can't get enough. That's so why I, I greatly appreciate the the drinking water. Uh, and the, the benefits that we have here in this country. In yeah, this and region. I'll add one thing about the Group B's. Normally, they are not tested with frequency, uh, maybe once a year, but because they're part of the PUD system, we try and do more than that to keep up yeah. taps on, especially if we're concerned about previous failings and stuff. So. Yeah, we well, serve a vital role. Thank you, gentlemen. And the doctor has a question, a comment. No. <laughs> I just wanted to express my for group B's if people live on a single family well they know they need to take care of the water and if it's a group A system there's um, large mechanisms for that care yeah, it's but usually the, tested monthly yeah. yeah but the group B's sometimes fall through the cracks for nitrates and and for uh, bacteria and also for volatile inorganic and organic chemicals so I really appreciate the work you guys are doing to keep us healthy and like I said, it's a network throughout the county, so it represents a fair bit of decentralized. It's not all clustered in one place. Yeah, it represents yeah. uh, just generally keeping an eye on how water is proceeding with our county. Don't run away. We have another question. So in your new facility, are you widely advertising your open house or not? Uh, certainly uh, at the end of the month, yes. Thursday, May 31st? Right. Open house. Open house. And that's at the new headquarters, which is on the north end of Ruddle Road between Pacific and Lacey Boulevard. I don't know if you want that to go out public or not. That's fine. It is now. <laughs> uh, it's there. Uh, we already had our um, open house to the other PUD commissioners, which is a quite a motley group. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so you won't Calm be encountering down. them, but just other locals will be their local elected officials. Okay. And we have a planning session all day long that day, the commission does. Oh. Uh, so we'll, we'll do what we can. We'll find a way to make it to open house. Sure, we'll try and keep the lights Thank on you, for you. Don't run away, we got a proclamation for you. He's going to read. <laughs> oh, here we go. Whereas healthy communities and a vibrant community rely on safe and reliable drinking water, and whereas any measure of a successful society, low mortality rates, economic growth and diversity, productivity and public safety are in some way related to access to safe water. And whereas Thurston County is blessed with an abundant groundwater resources that provide a safe and reliable source of water. And whereas some 918 public water systems and thousands of individual wells provide drinking water to over 99% of Thurston County residents and businesses, 
and whereas the dedicated men and women who work every day to operate, maintain, manage, and protect Thurston County's public water supplies deserve our gratitude for their tireless efforts to keep our water safe and flowing, and whereas each resident of our county can help sustain our water resources by educating themselves about their drinking water, practicing water conservation, and getting involved with local efforts to protect their waters from pollu pollution, and whereas what we do today to protect our drinking water and invest in the infrastructure that delivers it will affect the prosperity and well-being of our future generations. Now, therefore, be resolved the Thurston County Board of Health hereby proclaims May 6th through the 12th, 2018 as Drinking Water Week and calls upon all the people in Thurston County to recognize this precious resource and to help protect our source waters from pollution to practice water conservation, to actively become involved in local water issues, and plan for its efficient use. Adopted this eighth day of May 2018, signed by your Board of Health. We'd like to have a photo with you, Chris, and Anthony, and Jim, and Art. You want to come up and show you want to? And, uh, yeah, sure. We'll put Jim, uh, Chris right in the middle. And then everybody can get around him. There you go. Ta da! Yeah, 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 yeah. Jump in there. Okay. Oh, yep, the doctor. You can get him. Come closer, Anthony. We know about him. He's going to get on that chair. That one? Mm hmm. Yay. Drinking water. Thank you so much, sir. It's good to see you. Yeah, good. Pleasure to meet you. Chris, as always. <laughs> all right, all right. Here we go. All right. Well, if you think water is a critical asset to life, uh, the next proclamation is absolutely well <coughs> deserved in terms of uh, recognizing Nurses Week. And we have some of the best nurses in Thurston County. And so um, I might ask Liz Davis to come to the podium and give us a little bit of background on the nurses here we have in Thurston County. And um, we'll read a proclamation. Sure. Hi, Liz. Hi, Commissioners. Hello. I'm Liz Davis, uh, Director of the Child, Family, and Community Wellness Division at Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. And as you mentioned, this is National Nursing Week, which runs from May 6th to May 12th, which is the birthday of Florence Nightingale, yeah, who yeah. is considered the founder wow. of modern nursing. I used to love to read about her when I was a little girl. And uh, so today, we, this week, celebrate all our nurses in our community, mm -hmm. but um, including one of our presenters later on, yeah. TJ LaRock is a nurse at Providence as Holy well. And smacks. strangely, he was here during this proclamation week last year. So um, we're Timing. glad to have him here as well. But we also want to celebrate our nurses at Public Health and Social Services, not only um, our nurses who work in disease control and prevention, but also our nurses who work in maternal child health and do, do so much good work for kids and families and moms in our community. So today we have with us uh, Bonnie Peterson, who is our special children with special health care needs nurse, and also Kathy Sherman and Fumi Nakasone, who are our nurses, some of our nurses and nurse family partnership here to accept uh, the proclamation for Nurses Week, but also wanted to say um, today all our nurses in the department received some goodie bags so that we could say thank you for all the good work that they do. And also, they don't know this yet, but for all of our maternal <laughs> child health nurses, um, for each of them, we have a book in their honor that is going to be Aww, donated to South Sound Reading Foundation that is about nursing in some uh, variety, either about nursing as a profession or a biography of Florence Nightingale so that kids can learn about nursing and consider it as a career as they get older. That's so, cool. Kathy, Bonnie, 
for me? Yay. Hi, That's Bonnie. That's a good idea. Come on up to the mic. Well, first of all, Can I you do me a favor, this. Bonnie? Pull the mic down. There you go. I've been Thank doing you. this for a little while. Yeah, I know. Um, I'm on my 38th year at wow. the health department. We love you for it. And it's been a privilege, actually, working for the health department and being a public health nurse. I really want to thank the commissioners for all your support that you have given us over the years to keep these programs growing. And right now, we have 13 public health nurses that work in maternal child health programs, that is, Nurse Family Partnership and the program show us special health care needs. And then we have two nurses that work in communicable disease. Mm. It's not here right now, but they're working busy, they're busy, but what sets public health nurse apart from the hospital? Because when I came into this, I said I was only going to be the, do this for about mm. two or three years. <laughs> and what I did is I fell in love with it because I really could see that it's the long term that you work with families. And it takes a, it, and you have to have a heart for this type of a job or else it'll get to you. But you really can see the strengths in people that they don't see themselves. But that's what we're doing is trying to build on relationships, build their trust, so that we can work with them to, to strengthen their, their, their potential to be the best parent they can with their children. And I work in a program called Children with Special Health Care Needs. And so it's very stressful to these families who have a child that is born with, that are preemie or maybe they've got a congenital birth defect or some acute illness or chronic illness, terminal illness and stuff. And I think that just working with them and seeing the, how I can support them, and maybe I can't do anything about it. And maybe I can give them some information about it. But be there for that support means all the difference in how they're going to take care of their infant and other children. So... I think that the most, the most important thing that I've learned is listening. Listening to the parents so that they, so I understand where they're coming from, so that it, the, all these programs we have are parent-driven. And that means that it's up to the parent on what they want to learn and where they want to go. And we're there to just help guide them, to inspire them and encourage them to be the best that they can be. And that's not what hospitals do. Hospitals are short-term you know, you get in there and you can be in control of them and you can tell them to do things and they have to do it. But when it comes to public health and being a nurse, it's that patience and that long-term relationship that really makes all the difference in the world. And I have parents that I've seen in grocery stores and different events and stuff that I've seen 15, 20 years ago that still remember me and say, hey, thanks for helping me. With my baby, you know, my baby's now getting married. So, I mean, I hear that, and the other nurses sometimes say, hey, I saw a patient that you saw 25 years ago. So, I mean, it does mean that we do do good work. All of the nurses do. And I think this program really inspires me to be a better person because I learn from them, and I learn their adversities and how they overcome things, and then it makes me say, hey, well, my life can be the same way. And it gives me strength and courage to do changes, too. So I think that it keeps me growing and learning. And I really appreciate the public health nursing. I'm going to give you Kathy. Yay. We'll oh, wait, Kathy. wait, wait. We've got a question for you, Bonnie, first. Uh -huh. For you, Bonnie. You say you've been doing this 38 years? Uh-huh. And we have, currently we have 13 nurses and, you say, in children or? It's, it's maternal child health. We have thir uh, 12 nurses in Nurse Family Partnership, and then myself and children with special health needs, and then we have two nurses that do communicable disease. Do you know 38 years ago how many we had doing that? Oh, I would say maybe seven, seven or eight. So we have 13 now, and how many do you suppose we need? Oh, we could double that for sure. <laughs> we really could. I mean, and, and, and I definitely, I know that we... Gretchen, our, our fearless leader here in maternal child and health, she's been really working at every opportunity when she sees funding come up to build that. Oh, my God. And, and so, and we've gone regional, and that's what Kathy will probably talk about in Nurse Family Partnership. Okay. But, yeah, as, as population grows, I think it would be nice if we could serve more, more families. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much for your 38 years. Don't go too far, Bonnie. Do I have a proclamation? Okay, yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> 
Hi, Kathy. Hi, Hi Kathy. Kathy Sherman. I work with Nurse Family Partnership, and like Bonnie, I'd like to thank the support we've had from you commissioners for our programs. Um, the importance of the public health and nurses, you have all recognized and been on visits and supported us to help improve the lives of the mothers and, and babies in our community. Um, our nurses work with some of the most vulnerable children and, in, and families in our community, and we're very dedicated to um, work with our families and help them reach their goals and their, their dreams for their children and themselves. Um, some of the outcomes as in Nurse Family Partnership that we've achieved in our community are a 56% um, reduction in the emergency room visits um, with accidents and poisonings, a 48% reduction in child abuse and neglect, which is really important. We've also had a large reduction in preterm births, which saves a lot of money to the community, an increase in the number of mothers that actually finish high school and even college. And as a result um, of the work, there's a return investment for every $5.70 spent for our program, um, for every dollar, or we, <laughs> the return of the investment um, for every dollar to the program is $5.70. Sure. Um, so as you can see, our nurses work on a lot of different things with families from their health to navigating um, housing to reaching their goals and um, enriching their children's lives. So we really thank you for our support. You bet, absolutely. Love being there. Do you have any questions for me? Yeah, you, working with nurses over the uh, over the decades uh, at Capital Medical Center in St. Pete's, uh, the humor is very much like law enforcement humor. Um, and but I think it's the same type of person that draws the individual to that plan of work because you have a tremendous amount of care, professionalism, and compassion. Uh, and I can see over the decades how it chews up some people. So I, I really de uh, am, uh, am grateful for what you do uh, and glad that you do that as well uh, because it's, it's not easy work. But if you save, of course, if you save a child, you're saving a life. But if you're saving a parent, and I know in NFP you are, you're saving a family. And that's just powerful work. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'd like to express my gratitude to all the nurses here in Thurston County and throughout the, the country, to be quite honest with you. Um, I'm a little biased. I have a daughter that's a nurse who graduated from WSU, is a, and she went on to Portland, and now a ICU intensive care nurse in Detroit, Michigan. And I love watching her grow to be a professional woman and be there on time as nurses are. And I would say, in a kind of a simple way, but not overstating it, that doctors heal. I mean, doctors, as Robin would say, doctors re reconstruct or, or repair, but nurses heal and care. And that's what I absolutely walk away with when I see the nurses here and nurse family partnership or what have you. Um, because it's not just the individual, although you do take care of individuals. You turn the tide of how a community becomes uh, healthy and stays healthy and vibrant. And um, you are on the front line of that. And it just really makes me proud to be a commissioner to be able to help out where I can. We all can in terms of um, what you do as far as healing and caring with people here in this county. So thank you so much and God bless you for it. Thank so. you. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so with that, I have a proclamation. We have a proclamation you'd like to read and have a photo. Whereas, since 1991, National Nurses Week is celebrated annually from May 6th, National Nurses Day, through May 12th, Florence Nightingale's birthday. And whereas, nearly 84,000 registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, and advanced registered nurse practitioners including staff nurses, nurse educators, nurse practitioners, school nurses, public health nurses, long-term care nurses, nurse managers, and nurses in many other practice areas work in Washington State. And whereas nurses are public health heroes who make our communities safer and healthier and contribute to our community as community advocates, educators, and providers of critical health services, and whereas nurses provide a timeless commitment uh, to our community 365 days a year and touch many vulnerable individuals and their families with a caring and competent presence. And whereas nurses represent the front line of most health systems, including public health, and whereas nurses' contributions are considered crucial to the delivery of effective, high-quality care with positive, lasting outcomes, and whereas 
The American Nurses Association has declared the week of May 6th through 12th, 2018 as National Nurses Week. Nurses inspire, innovate, influence. Now, therefore, it be resolved the Thurston County Board of Health hereby proclaims May 6th through 12, 2018 as Nurses Week in Thurston County and calls upon all citizens, community, state agencies, faith groups, medical facilities, elected leaders, and businesses to celebrate nurses' accomplishments and efforts to improve our health care system and show our appreciation for the nation's and our community's nurses, not just during this week, but rather to join us in honoring the many nurses who care for us, all of us at every opportunity throughout the year. Adopted this eighth day of May 2018, signed by your Board of Health. Nurses. Who want to come up to? Doctor, come on. Bonnie, you get the player, or Kathy, one of y'all get to hold it in the middle and we'll surround you. Is that all right? Alrighty. There you go. I want to be surrounded by nurses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yep. TJ's a nurse. That's right. That's okay. <laughs> No, I didn't change. I didn't, yeah, he's got a he's silly tie. tie. He's sports tie. <laughs> there you go. All right, you ready, there Bonnie? You yeah, I'm right. ready. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know that, TJ. <laughs> I didn't either, TJ. Thank you. That was two. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. <laughs> Kathy. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. We got something? Oh, I don't think so. Okay, okay. Okay. So, um, <coughs> we're at the portion of the agenda where the opportunity for the public to address the board. I see people who signed here, but I think they came here for a different portion of the agenda, but I just want to see by a show of hands, is there anybody in the public who would like to come forward to the podium to speak? Seeing no one, we'll move on and we'll go to the other portion of the agenda, which is the departmental items, and that would be item number four. And today we have uh, the Providence Community, Providence Community Care Center update, and T.J. LaRock is here to give us that update. And do you want to say a word or two, or you just, uh, Sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, I'm just going to say welcome, TJ. Uh, it's great to have you here, and especially on this day. So uh, the Community Care Center is a collaboration between Providence St. Peter Hospital and other local nonprofit organizations who work together to provide a single point of access for street-dependent individuals needing access to behavioral health, substance abuse, housing, and many other services at the Community Care Center. And, Today, TJ is going to give us an update on how the community care center is going and what some of the needs, challenges, and successes are, and how we can support the community care center as a community. So, thank you, TJ. Yeah, thank, thank you, TJ. Again, I'm TJ Larock with Providence uh, Behavioral Health, and I am the manager at the community care center. Um, I appreciate being here for the second time in two years on this day. It just happens to be um, <laughs> Nurses Week, which, which I am, so that's nice. Um, I guess I think the kind of nursing I do these days is definitely public health, um, working at the community care center. But uh, basically, um, we are continued, um, continuing to work uh, hard at getting to know um, and building trust with the population that we serve in our community, which is primarily a very vulnerable and homeless um, population. Uh, we have um, been able to be um, pretty successful in um, our uh, connection to behavioral health um, services. Um, we have two full-time case managers, one for Providence and one for behavioral health resources, a part-time nurse practitioner and myself on a behavioral health team within the community care center. And we have had a little over 1,200 um, behavioral health contacts since we've been open. And that's to a few, a, a few uh, over now 100 um, different unique individuals that we've provided um, some sort of connection to mental health services. So that either means we continue to provide service for them at the community care center or we've got them re-engaged uh, into services elsewhere in the community or we've helped them while they're transitioning um, into another community um, uh, and get, getting mental health services in that interim. Um, 
the great bulk of that are community or case management services, um, but we um, also um, provide medication bridge management um, for, for some people at the community care center as well. And we recently were approved to hire two new case managers and move the um, nurse practitioner position to full time. So we will be almost doubling what our current capacity is in behavioral health, which is greatly needed. Um, when we work with people uh, at the community care center, it's a very intensive type of case management. Um, it requires a lot of, um, of resources, and so we need more folks to help um, with, with that role. Um, but it has been quite um, successful in that piece. Um, and as far as housing goes, the housing assessment numbers, so getting people into the housing services and the adult services continue to climb, um, but uh, the numbers of actually housing people um, are staying kind of steady in terms of diversion and, um, and uh, some of the, the quicker ways to get into housing, but we still struggle with permanent supportive housing. Um, there's only about one to two units that come available in the permanent supportive housing um, model uh, each month, so some of our most vulnerable people take much longer to get into um, housing. Hopefully that will change some as the home fund um, in the city of Olympia comes online and um, we start building units. Uh, another challenge that we uh, often have is although we have the capacity to do on-site SUD or substance use assessments um, and we're increasing our capacity to do that, uh, we do find that getting access to detox beds or inpatient treatment are um, particularly challenging. Um, and that would probably be even greater when we're talking about folks who have a methamphetamine um, dependence because um, those, they don't usually go into detox and so there's not a lot of, um, of available um, venues for people to, to, to get the, those services. So um, we continue to work with them and, and get more people um, kind of ready and get, getting those assessments done. Um, we, uh, let's see, we, so the, those, I mentioned kind of the challenges there in terms of the, the lack of detox and the number of, of um, permanent supportive housing. So we do get sometimes a bottleneck of people coming through the community care center. Um, we did not uh, enjoy having a warming center or a day center uh, in the community this year. So we were seeing throughout the winter, um, the first two quarters, an average of between 175 and 200 people come through the community care center a day. Uh, the last 10 days, it's been nice because the weather has been warm. So our average is down closer to uh, 100 a day, um, which is actually so much more manageable in terms of being able to really coordinate care around the individuals that are that are at our facility and often the, the most vulnerable folks are the people who stay and are there um, during the, these days. So that's been a, a nice improvement. Um, we have 16 providers of different, different service providers that are now providing care um, in the community care center, um, which is an increase from when we opened, which was at 11. So there are five new um, agencies through the last six or seven months that we've been open. Um, we just participated in Arts Walk um, downtown, and our guests actually um, made the artwork, and we displayed that, and it was quite, mm. quite fun to be a part of the community in a different way um, for that day. We've also added regular um, art activities, yoga, meditation, and writing workshops, um, so that's an addition to the 16 providers that are providing care there. Um, we I'm, I'm had the opportunity this morning to meet with both the Olympia Downtown Alliance and the City of Olympia's new homeless coordinator, and I am um, really looking forward to the direction that we are heading with more services um, becoming available outside of the community care center to, to our um, guests so that we are really able to put the whole package together and get people into housing um, and, and kind of into that next um, phase in their lives. So that's kind of where we're at in a, in a nutshell. Uh, questions of TJ. Oh, of course. Yeah, of okay. course. <laughs> the, you say a lot of your uh, clientele participated in Arts Walk. Yes. What did they do? What, uh, um, we actually partnered. My mom owns the Painted Plate in downtown Olympia, and so we partnered. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So okay. we partnered with the Painted Plate, and um, she, her employees, and she came several times um, and painted uh, and helped give instructions and all that, and we painted uh, uh, items um, that we then displayed um, in our community room. So, um, yeah, it was really fun. And very we're going nice. to continue to do more of those projects, partnering with the Painted Plate around art. So very nice, very yeah. nice. Um, and I liken the work that uh, that you do, or the, uh, your staff, uh, mm -hmm. Providence Community Care Center, uh, to like law enforcement, yes. uh, because you're dealing with a certain segment of our population that really demands. It's high demand, high needy, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but they they just need some help. They need help, mm -hmm. and you're there for that. Uh, and so you have far more successful stories than there are negative ones, but people don't see that, and it doesn't make our newspaper a record. Uh, 
and I mean that in the, in the way it's meant. Um, <laughs> but you work constantly with the people that are surfing the edge of chaos and sorting them through every little issue. And, uh, and it's, it's, I mean, it's life-saving. And for many, I hope, life-altering. Uh, so I want you to know that I greatly appreciate all the work that's being done down there, TJ. I really appreciate that you're saying that. It is um, much more apparent to see what happens outside of our building and what the challenges are in terms of impact on neighbors and that kind of thing that it is to see what, what's going on inside the walls. And so to acknowledge um, what it is we're doing inside is always, is always a great plus. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Do you up. agree they're surfing the edge of chaos I do. In fact, daily. I often refer to the community care center as a chaos funnel. Um, and yeah, so what I mean by that is most, most services um, are set up in our community where there's sort of a wall put up in place. And once you pass that wall, you're expected to follow a certain set of rules exactly the way that appointment-based type of care um, follows. And I don't mean we don't have lots of, of vigorous rules at the community care center. I don't want to um, make it seem like we don't. But what I'm saying is th that it's set up so that it's, it meets the provider's needs in terms of what the expectations are. What we try to do is get the people in through the door um, or into our outdoor area and really get to know them, build that trust, and then eventually, because their lives are chaotic, yeah. and we need to acknowledge that that's going on and that they're in that state of trauma. And then as they get that trust and they build that, that we funnel them into those services over time as they're, they're able to do that. So, uh, yeah, yes, thank absolutely. You. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just like to second some of what Commissioner Hutchins said. I've watched um, the whole program as you're in charge of it just grow to be something more than what it used to in the sense of just people hanging out. Now there's direction and movement. And uh, I know it's not always easy, always easy, but thanks to your guidance, your leadership, I come down there and try to participate where I can. And I thank you immensely for what you do. So Yeah, we appreciate you. Thank you. You bet. All righty. So I'm going to turn to... Shelly and ask her if she would uh, introduce the next person is the uh, person of hope. And I'll just kind of leave it at that and let her take it from there. Huh? <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago, I, along with Commissioner Hutchings and Commissioner Blake, um, as well as many from our behavioral health organization and treatment sales tech staff, had the opportunity to attend the National Behavioral Health Conference in Washington, D.C. And we heard from the former Surgeon General and many other speakers that one of the biggest public health concerns for our time is loneliness. Yep. And the reduction in lifespan for loneliness is similar to that caused by smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's greater than obesity. It's associated with greater risk of heart disease, depression, anxiety, and dementia. And when I heard of this, I thought about our Thurston Thrive's efforts to increase social connections. But I really thought about hope and our hope research. And hope, which has proven to inc increase the lifespan and improves all those health outcomes that can mitigate things like loneliness. So a group of Thurston Thrive's <coughs> leaders, um, ranging from public health, criminal justice, nonprofits, um, and others have formed a group called Hope Thurston. And today, I'm pleased we have our own champion of hope and leader of one of our Thurston Thrive's action teams. Um, Thurston County Prosecutor John Tienheim is going to talk about our Community Hope Initiative and leave us all with some sir. extra hope Thank today. You. Thank you. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here to uh, talk to you and to the community a little bit about Hope Thurston. I am what I've decided. I'm self-proclaiming myself a hopeologist. Hopeologist. Uh, <laughs> in that I have become intensely interested Not a hope or in this or... idea of hope and mm -hmm. talk about it frequently in the, in the community. And in particular, I'm very interested in uh, the science of hope and the research that <coughs> underlies uh, hope theory. Uh, so today I'm going to just take a few minutes to give you a brief outline of this project that we've now called Hope Thurston. Uh, not only what we're doing this year, but then a little bit about what the future looks like uh, for Hope Thurston. Our goal is to essentially make Thurston County a hope-informed community and a hope-inspired community. Uh, so before I dig into the actual Hope uh, Thurston uh, project itself, I want to do a little refresher on Hope Theory. Uh, and primarily for the audience, because I know both of you have heard my hope talk. Most of the other people in the room have heard me talk about hope. And in fact, the Nurse Family Partnership has been through my hope workshop and incorporated hope into their uh, practice. So uh, we are spreading hope um, pretty liberally in this county right now. Uh, I've put on the screen uh, a basic diagram of hope theory, just, just so people can kind of understand what I'm talking about. When we talk about hope theory, which is a, a, a actually large body of research that comes out 
of a field of positive psychology. Uh, when I talk about hope theory, uh, I need to define hope in a very specific way. Um, because we use hope a lot in everyday language in a variety of different circumstances. So the way that I use hope is this. Hope is the belief that the future can be better than the present and that we have the ability to make it so. So in other words, hope is a combination of optimism, which is this idea that the future can be better than the present, but it also has this idea that hope is uh, about our belief that we have influence in our future, that we in fact can do things to create a better future for ourselves. And the way that we do that, when we envision a better future for ourselves, the first thing that we do around that is set goals. And I think everybody can relate to that because we set goals in our lives, whether that's personal goals, professional goals, goals in our relationships, goals in our hobbies, whatever that might be. But hope begins with the setting of a goal because whenever you set a goal, you are in fact uh, thinking about and um, and really actualizing this idea that there's a better future. I see a better future, I'm setting a goal towards that. But hope theory contemplates that once that goal is set, we need, two, uh, we need to have two essential elements to move us towards that goal. One is willpower. That is the idea that we are willing to expend energy towards that goal and to achieve that goal. We are in fact committed to working <coughs> to make that goal happen, okay? The second thing is uh, what the research calls way power. And the current literature really refers to it as pathway thinking or strategic thinking. The idea is that we not only have to see the goal and have the, the, the desire and the willpower and the energy to achieve the goal, but we need to see a pathway to that goal. We need to be able to uh, strategically think about how we achieve that goal. Uh, and so in the, in the research, that's called way power. And, goal, and hope then is made up of a combination of willpower and way power. The way that I remember this is the old phrase, where there's a will, there's a way, right? Um, that is really a hope statement. That is about achieving a goal by combining willpower and way power. Let's see if my pointer's gonna work. Uh, and so when we look at hope theory, and I'm just gonna spend a second talking about so what? We can define hope, we can create this chart, so what? Why do we care about hope? Well, there's about a thousand plus research studies now that show hope is probably uh, the leading predictor of a person's ability to thrive and flourish. Now that's important. I think in a public health and set setting, you probably couldn't ask for a more important um, aspect. The best predictor of a person's ability to thrive and flourish. Uh, there's research that connects it to higher productivity in the workplace, lower absences, higher health, longer lifespan. Um, uh, Hope now is the best predictor of success in college. It outperforms the SAT and the ACT in terms of predicting college success and academic success. It predicts a uh, grade point improvement in high school by about a grade point uh, uh, average. Higher hope managers have higher profit businesses. Uh, all of those things are based in the literature and the research now around hope. And we have a significant amount of hope research that we have incorporated into uh, the various different um, ways that we're looking at uh, the Thurston Thrives project. Um, but we've become very interested, when I say we, I'm talking about kind of the, the group of folks that are really interested in hope theory in this county, working with a researcher from Oklahoma named Chan Hellman, who's probably one of the leading hope researchers in the world right now. Um, we have become more interested perhaps in how hope impacts organizations and even more importantly, communities. And this idea of collective hope. Is it possible that we can actually have hope as a group um, and a collective of people as opposed to our individual hope? And so what does that mean? Well, it means can a community actually develop and have shared goals? Can it empower itself and have the willpower to move forward and achieve those goals? Can, is the community able to think strategically about how to achieve its goals and work together in order to do that? And Dr. Hellman has devised a tool to actually measure that. And so we can actually look at and measure the amount of collective hope in an organization or more importantly in a community. Thus the idea around Hope Thurston. This is based on a project that happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, called How Hopeful is Tulsa? Uh, where the researchers basically created a hope map of the city of Tulsa. And they were able actually to have a picture 
a map, if you will, of how hope laid out in the, in the uh, various areas of Tulsa. And then connect hope to various predictors. So, for instance, hope was found to be a predictor of higher community engagement, higher community goal achievement, higher voter turnout, higher trust in government and in public officials. Um, and the list goes on from there. Um, so we have become interested now in mapping hope in Thurston County, and thus we have Project Hope Thurston. And I'm very proud of hmm. our new logo here, uh, laying out Hope Thurston. And this is what that project looks at if I was going to diagram it. Um, first of all, we are uh, basically going to engage in a countywide survey over the summer. Uh, we hope to release it in June and run it for as long as we need to to get a, a big enough sample to make it a valid survey. Uh, but this survey will attempt to measure the hope of Thurston County, countywide through a variety of different populations so that we can really look at and map out how hope um, is distributed throughout Thurston County. But we're also going to look at associating hope Thurston or uh, associating hope, uh, both collective hope and individual hope with other uh, things that Thurston Thrives is interested. So for instance, does access to transportation affect hope? Does access to health care impact hope? Does access to good food impact hope? Uh, is the, the walkability of the neighborhood, does that look at and impact hope? Uh, and so we're devising a survey to look at all of these key things to see what things might actually be associated with hope. We're also going to be collecting information, demographic information from people to link our hope survey to other information like the Healthy Youth Survey and the BRFS, the acronym, I can never remember what it stands for. Shelley's got it memorized, I'm sure, but... B-R-F-S-S. Yes. Correct. Something, and, something, something Shelley Slaughter. It's a, it's, <laughs> but it is, it is a, a, safe to say it is a, is a, is a wealth of information <laughs> that we could tap into and now start even looking at more and more connections between hope and other indicators of health, in particular particularly those social indicators of health that, that Thurston Thrives is focused on. We're doing this uh, with big thanks for, uh, for a contribution by the Community Foundation, who has stepped up to help us fund this effort in the creation of the uh, survey to uh, put together the resources we need to implement and to actually make this survey happen. Here's how it works. We will start by engaging the community in hope uh, in in the science of hope and what that means. Actually, I've been really doing that for the last two years plus. I've engaged this community in this idea of hope and what it means to be hopeful. Uh, from that, we will do this assessment. This is the survey. We are assessing the community for hope. What is our level of hope in this community? How does it vary? Is hope different in Olympia or Tumwater or Lacey or other rural county areas? Um, and neighborhood by neighborhood. Once we have that hope map, we will actually then sit down to try to create a strategic plan, a pathway, if you will, to the goal of increasing hope in the community, uh, countywide. Uh, this will, what this plan looks like, I don't really know at that point, at this point, because we need to have this information. Uh, but the idea will be to try to find ways to move the hope needle upwards. Then we'll spend the next three to five years executing this plan. Uh, in the Hope Thurston plan, if you will, and then uh, resources willing and so forth, reassess again, actually do the survey over again and see if we move the needle, see if we actually were able to raise the hope of Thurston County. And if so, then of course the big issue and the big uh, project is to sustain that. How do we keep the hope that we've created in the county, keep it going and keep it moving? Uh, Dr. Hellman likes to say uh, hope is a social gift we give each other. Uh, Shelley alluded to this, that hope is very much founded in relationships. Uh, with kids, there's a long uh, line of hope research that tells us that one of the biggest factors in raising hope in, the, in, a, in, the, in a child is having a caring, supportive adult in their life, which also happens to be one of the biggest um, indicators of resilience to uh, adversity. Um, Hope is a social gift we give each other. I'm not at all surprised by the data that you heard about in terms of loneliness. Um, hope uh, actually thrives through uh, those relationships. Uh, so in a way, I think we're looking at this project 
as a way to unite this community, to um, bring people together, to give us something that we all have in common in the fact that we all want to be hopeful, we all want to see a better future, and we are all committed to moving forward towards that better future. I really appreciate the time to, for this presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. Any other questions? The BRFSS. Is it the uh, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system that's the one. assessment? Is that yep, that's the one. That, okay. Thank you. Well, it would drive me nuts, so yep. I had to figure it out. I'm, gl I'm glad you've got the Google in front of you. Because <laughs> <Yeah, whatever. that's laughs> <exactly. laughs> I have to Google it every time I want to know. <laughs> uh, and Google's not a verb, but we use it as a verb. I, I hear you. Um, <laughs> We went, uh, as, as Shelley said, the three of us, uh, Commissioner Blake and I, and Shelley attended uh, NatCon, uh, the National Conference on Behavioral Health in uh, Washington, D.C. a couple weeks ago, and I saw a speaker, we heard a speaker, Dr. Brené Brown. Fabulous. B-R-E-N-E, Brown, she does TED Talks, she's written several books, and one was uh, Braving the Wilderness. Mm -hmm. But what she did was, she was profoundly, it just touched the heart and the soul and the core of anybody, but she talked about how we are now, in this world, today's world, we are so connected with each other. Cell phones around the world, uh, Facebook, uh, email, texting, uh, uh, what's the other one, uh, Skype. We are so well connected, but and yet at the, at, the, at the same time, we are the most lonely that we've ever been. Mm -hmm. and it was a very, very good presentation. And she talked about the loneliness, and she touched on hope, not as deep as, as you've gone, John. Uh, but she touched on hope, and it was in there, and it was, I kept thinking of you. And I thought, wow, what a good presentation, and a very, very good presenter. But Dr. Brene Brown, she did a wonderful job. I'll, I'll, I'm going to probably get that name from you and oh. maybe look at some of the TED Talks. And I have a, I have a book. Yeah. yeah, everybody received a book. She'll be so, back uh, to Seattle next year. I'll pass the information on to you. Okay. There is, um, uh, there was something there that I was going to, um, that triggered me. Oh, um, Snyder, who's the kind of the father of hope theory, Dr. Snyder out of the University of Kansas, uh, really theorized that relationships are in fact built on hope. That when you build a relationship, you're really building that on this on, on commonality of goals and pathways. You're looking for things you have in common, and, and that's what you relate to. Uh, so many people in relationships meet when they have common goals at work or whatever like that, and they build relationships on that. And so I've become convinced that Hope and relationships are inextricably intertwined, that they really uh, develop together and they um, both thrive on each other. It's, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship, if you will. And, and does it stop? After 43 years, my wife and I are still hopeful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's a different kind of hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going right. to be a, a different kind of approach to this because I've been, um, since the four years I've known you and the three or so years you've been uh, involved with Hope Shelley, Liz, and Megan, and a couple others, I've always been interested in the Hope uh, the hope Theory, Hope Science, and Dr. Chan, too, and um, where suicide <laughs> comes into play. And look at it from different ang lenses, but just the whole hope where it happens and what you're talking about, raising mm -hmm. it for a county of the big umbrella, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I applaud you immensely for doing that. But then when it comes to suicide, I've always been intrigued where people lose that hope or hope has failed. I'll use that word not in the sense of uh, a failure and complete dismal thing, but just it didn't happen for some reason in someone's life. So that's just me. I'm intrigued by that and uh, attempts of suicide. Those were, did they leave signs back to where hope didn't happen for them in the same way that you've put it in this context. But right. thank you for what you do and uh, look forward to a lot of successes and um, bringing the community health uh, to a greater, higher level and uh, yeah, it's very, very important to us. So. Thank you. I, and I'll say that um, I'd love to have a conversation with you offline about hope and suicide because there's actually a fair amount of discussion about that mm. and that one of the biggest predictors of suicide is uh, feelings of despair right uh, which is uh, in the chain towards hopelessness so the loss of hope actually can be directly attributed to uh, suicide yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah all right all right thank, thank you that. thank you so thank much you, sir.
So that was um, item number five, and um, we'll move on to item number six, which is uh, uh, an update on the drinking water program here in Thurston County. And uh, I'll ask Shelley to introduce the guy that's coming up. Yep. <laughs> Star Art, are you coming up also, Art? So I can just introduce her. Yeah, yeah. So this is Eric Iverson. Uh, he's the, our biologist, but that really means that in addition to running our drinking water lab, he's the supervisor of our drinking water program. And so Eric is here to give you an update on our, our drinking water program and the different things we do in Thurston County. It seemed like a perfect fit since it's drinking water week. Yeah. Here's right. Eric. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me today. Um, just here to give you guys a brief overview of what the drinking water program is and uh, mention that we do it every week, not just drinking water week. So. Yeah, it um, is every day, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the main categories, the functions of the program include uh, our Group B program, um, which uh, is in conjunction with the Department of Health, our partner, um, administering WAC 246-291 with a Group B rule. Um, another big part of the program is our Group A program. Um, with the Group A, which are larger water systems, uh, we assist the Department of Health in conducting sanitary surveys. So they're pretty extensive um, uh, in inspections of water systems and everything from the paperwork side to water being delivered from the tap. Uh, we also, in that uh, joint plan of responsibility, assist when there is a problem with the system. Um, we go out and help them determine what's going on, um, help them the system find out what it is and provide resources if, if anything to help them get that taken care of. Uh, something we fortunately aren't uh, too big on, haven't had to do a lot of is epidemiological investigations and it's partly attributed to the planning that goes into a water system in the first place. Um, another big function of the drinking water program is our uh, partnership with Department of Ecology. Um, there we have a contract with them to inspect well construction um, and decommissioning of, uh, to make sure that it meets their standards and is done properly. Uh, we also conduct well site inspections. So a public water system is interested in having a groundwater source. We hopefully go out there before anything's done um, and say, yes, that's a good spot for a well. Um, and associated but not the same is our drinking water lab where there's a lot of overlap. Uh, we test water for group A, group B, and private well systems and we help the community in that way. So I'll touch base on each of these programs in a little bit more depth. So group B systems. Uh, there are smaller public water systems. They are serving fewer than 15 connections. You can think of a connection as a home or a business. Um, something like that. Um, but it's not just connections, it can also mean populations of the system. So a group B system is one that serves fewer than 25 people in a day. And a group B can also serve more than 25 people in a day as long as that doesn't exceed 60 days in a year. Um, anything higher than that we're going to be bumped up into the group A standards. Um, one other small niche that we don't have any of in Thurston County is a thousand or more people for two or more consecutive days. That, if it serves that much, it's more a group A system at that point in time. So in Thurston County, we have 527 group B public water systems. Um, these are systems that are, they obtain an annual operating permit um, and are expected to monitor their water quality on a yearly basis uh, for bacteriological quality um, and every three years uh, for nitrates. Uh, this is something we've been paying a lot of attention to lately, uh, reining in some systems that have fallen off the map so to speak and are trying to make sure that people are up to date and the people who use water, and their assumption that it's safe is, is correct. Um, some of the services that our annual operating permit uh, provide for Group Bs is uh, not only the monitoring of the water quality, but helping them when something goes bad, guidance of how to get the resource to fix it, um, 
talking to either the manager of the system or the system users to explain what the issue is and how to best go about it. Um, we also are a resource for permitting purposes. Uh, many permits that go through the Building Development Center require approval of drinking water and we are there to make that as seamless as possible, uh, get the applicant in and get them the information they need. We also maintain a, a, a database uh, of records uh, for all these systems which come in handy because we get a lot of public records requests. Uh, anytime a home is being sold, many people want to know what's going on with that system, what kind of water they're going to be drinking, and we uh, provide them with that information. Another major type of Group B system we've had that uh, came in effect around 2015 is the Group B exempt. Uh, this this came to reality in a combination of a code change to WAC and I-502. Uh, we had an abundance of these small one and two connection businesses uh, that had seasonal bunches of people coming in to help process uh, their crops. And by definition, that would have had them to be a full-grown Group B and design review a lot of other things. And because it's low hazard based on some of the information in um, the WAC, it, we decided that we can relieve these people from all these extra cumbersome, if you will, uh, requirements for something such a small operation that these are also places that don't have uh, other authorities dictating their drinking water. Um, so they're not places like restaurants, they're not places where food processors, adult family homes, transient accommodations, stuff like that. Um, so our Group B and our local um, program is based around Thurston County Article 3. Um, Thurston County Article 3 is very similar to the Group B WAC uh, with the addition of annual operating permits for its users ongoing water quality monitoring, um, and we bring in one and two non-residential service connections that are of higher risk. On to our Group A system. Uh, like I mentioned before, we conduct sanitary surveys, and these are very extensive, extensive surveys. Uh, operational and managerial capacity, sources, disinfection, and treatment systems, the booster pumping facilities and their controls, pressure tanks and their controls, atmospheric or finished water storage tanks, the distribution systems in the ground. Something that came to fruition recently is cross-connection control programs in the city of Rainier and also operator certifications. We make sure that all those things, those functions are in place and if not, we work with the state to help them get those corrected. Um, there are 303 active Group A systems in Thurston County. And as I mentioned before, we do the technical assistance and epidemiological investigations when we're called upon to help with that. Well delegation uh, is another major part of our program, and this is again where we work with Department of Ecology to make sure uh, things are being done right. We, visit on-site well drillers uh, to make sure that their forms of construction are meeting the state WAC for, state, for well construction. Um, we also do after-the-fact inspections. Uh, included in this is we do before the fact uh, assistance to these uh, systems, well drillers, to make sure that that Battery. Keep going. So, uh, like I said, we work with the well drillers and uh, we try to prevent, that's our goal, uh, unusable uh, work. Thank you. Okay. 
So to kind of wrap things up, our drinking water lab. Um, we test locally for bacteriological quality, for coliform and E. coli, uh, test for nitrates, and our surface water testing is one thing we do is fecal coliform. And uh, this comes, we don't just help people in Thurston County in the lab. We have customers from Grace Harbor, Lewis, Pierce. I had one from Snohomish County today. Um, and quite a bit of partnership with Mason County Health Department as they don't have their own lab anymore. Um, we're able to touch the private side of the drinking water thing. Uh, not only do we help the, the public systems, of course, but a lot of private people who are selling their homes and banks are requiring them to sample. We, we do that for them, and more times than not, they go bad. And there's a lot of education that takes place. And, able to give them some resources to to move along and get what they need. Um, working with the lab and drinking water also allows an increased capacity to deal with emergencies. Uh, Summit Lake is, is, is in an active algae bloom and just set up so that we're able to run out there and test some water for a system that needed a little bit done and or have the potential to have the public go out there and use this system now. Um, was able to be done pretty quickly too because just the way we're set up so That's our drinking water program in a nutshell um, So if you have any questions, otherwise my information's there and feel free to contact me. Yeah. Just one quick one that is um, with the groupie testing they do the uh, the owners They test their own water. It's a self-test Yes, they bring samples in and such is that something that's monitored are they required to do it, and do we monitor compliance? It is a requirement. We do monitor it. And right now, if a, a system doesn't sample, mostly what happens is, is we let them know, hey, you, you're delinquent on this. And if they need something from us, that is a roadblock for them uh, to, to gain any kind of permits because there is a violation at that point in time. And I, and I, I know that word compliance is a heavy uh, heavy word, but I'm looking at helping people keep the water safe uh, and, and uh, potable for, for everybody, for families and such. So we have programs, if, if something fails or it's not coming back right, we can help them out, or do we help them out? We do. We help them out. Um, if we have systems recently that had bacteriological problems, if we can't help them talking to them and dealing with their management companies, we do site visits and we do a survey like we would on a Group A public water system on the Group B. Um, recently we've been compiling data of systems that just they haven't sampled and it could be some time um, and we're actively seeking those systems to do surveys on to maybe figure out why they're not doing it. Um, collecting samples ourselves and uh, okay. helping them because a lot of people on Group B systems, they just turn on their water and they think everything's fine. They don't know that someone's responsible for that and they're making assumptions that it is good. And that's the Great. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. Yeah, so a uh, Group B, that could be, can you just kind of define that a little bit more for me? Is it um, a single entity? I heard 15 or less, but it could be two or three, um, I guess, uh, house, or a business, a house, and a whole, and something else on a Group B. Because um, 527, I, I want to see a map of that. That's where I'm going with this, and I don't know if you have a map of that. We Can do have a map of that. Oh They're God, dots do? all over the place. Oh, I want to um, see it. And, and the other 303. <laughs> and, yeah. and 303, we don't map the Group A's, but we have, you know, the, the large cities, uh, mm -hmm. some of the larger Because that's Group 830. That's a lot of water systems. I know, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, it, it, it's no joke. And they, we have small water systems within the service areas of mm -hmm. the large cities. Um, which eventually coordinated water system plan that should come into a single entity after that i worry about the quality assurance not from your standpoint but just that much grouping a and b's together and making sure we get the quality of water we're looking for so that's our goal too yeah sure dr wood has a question how many of the groupies have absentee landlords you mentioned just mm. turning the water on and then they're in mexico and maybe there's increased nitrates um, in the system? The exact number, I'm not sure, Dr. Wood, but we do get calls on those. Those are ones that recently we had a depressurization of the system and no one was around to do anything, so they turned it back on. And 
we got calls. We sent someone out and did a lot of education on that one. Um, when we finally got a hold of that landlord, they they learned that that's something you don't just turn back on. There's procedures to take. Yeah. Anything else, Shelly? Did you? No. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Eric. It's very informative. That's the first time I've seen that, and that was very very intuitive. Yeah. So. Thank you. Okay, so next we have on the depart on the uh, agenda we have the surface water monitoring and safety, and I think Art is going to be able to do this, or is it Jeannie? Uh, Jane, Jane, you're going to do it, right? All right. No, I have to lower the mic. So my my name is Jane Mountjoy Benning with uh, Thurston County Environmental Health and. Mm -hmm. I'm the supervisor manager of the water quality and septic operations and maintenance program. All right. So today we're going to talk about the water quality end of things. And we do water quality monitoring and we do it because we, uh, we use the water and we want to be able to drink the water. Um, we want to go fishing. We want to go play in the water. Summer's coming. Um, eat fish, eat shellfish. All of those things, um, we're better off when we have clean water. So we want to keep track of that. That's what we do. So our program, the, the big goals are to identify problems, advise the public, track trends, and uh, determine program needs. So again, we, we want to do ongoing monitoring to see if there's problems out there, if we need to issue an alert or advise the public. We, we need that information to be able to do that. Are we getting better or worse? Are we meeting water quality um, criteria? For example, Eld Inlet, we're meeting the water quality criteria, but the trend is that the water quality is going down. Henderson Inlet, some of our stations don't meet water quality criteria, but the trend is going, for the most part, up except for a few spots. So we want to keep track of, of those kinds of details. And then that helps us determine where we need to go in and, and do more work. So we have um, several different aspects of our water quality monitoring. The first and kind of the backbone of the program is what's known as ambient um, monitoring. So we have both streams and lakes. That's regular, ongoing, long-term monitoring to figure out trends and, again, kind of, kind of like taking the blood pressure or something of our, our streams and lakes. We do response to algae blooms, um, testing for toxins, and I'll go into all of these a little more in depth as we go on. We monitor uh, swimming beaches and county parks, and we do uh, shellfish biotoxin monitoring. So it, you might have heard of that as red tide, but any kind of biotoxins. And we do investigative work, uh, responding to spills or, or identified or potential water quality per problems. Uh, that's what it looks like sometimes. It's fun. <laughs> uh, so in 2018, our ambient program um, includes 35 sites on 28 different streams and rivers. Uh, we're in all eight of our major watersheds. And that, that monitoring is once a month, um, year-round. So we're out there. It takes about a week each month. And then in the six months, beginning this month, May through October, we also monitor lakes, uh, so 10 lakes. And again, we have more lakes than that in the county, so we prioritize based on um, lakes that have public access, a lot of recreation, or it's a drinking water lake. And we do publish a water quality report that gets posted on our website. We're, uh, this is two years ago. We're working on last year's report right now. And we've also been working with a stormwater program, and we're, we're migrating our data over to their really cool new database. Um, so that's an ongoing project right now. And we're hoping, and probably it'll take about a year, we'll be able to have a reporting um, basis that's map-based that people can look at the map, click on the sampling site, and see the latest data. So that'll be really great when that's done. But Again, that's probably a year or so out. Okay, next kind of monitor we do is the, the toxic algae monitoring. So when we have an algae bloom, like we do right now, 
we go out and get samples, um, ideally of the scum and, and the water. And we send that off to uh, environmental health lab up in uh, Seattle and look for toxins. And if we have some at above the advisory limits, then we alert the public. Um, we are currently monitoring blooms in Summit Lake, Black Lake, and Hewitt Lake, and Chambers Lake. And we've already had a couple of blooms earlier this year in Clear Lake, Munn Lake, and Tempo Lake. So it's, it is an ongoing thing each summer. Uh, the only one currently that, that we know of that has um, toxic algae is Summit Lake, which of course is a big deal because that is a drinking water lake. Uh, we're still waiting to hear about Black Lake. We haven't gotten those results back. And people always want to know what causes this. We know what causes algae blooms, um, which is really increased nutrients uh, combined with weather and some of the physical aspects of a lake. What we don't know, and there's a lot of, you know, a lot of research ongoing, uh, scientists all around the world are looking at this, we don't know what makes the same species or the same algae plant um, that's just kind of floating around being scuzzy green algae to become a toxic algae bloom. So without that predictability, or, or, or without that knowledge, we can't predict when something is going to become toxic. The only way to find out is to test. Uh, these are the signs we use. They're, um, they're produced by the state and they're, they're the same across the state. So when we first take a sample, if there's an algae bloom, we'll post the the caution, the white sign that says there is an algae bloom, there might be toxins, watch out. Then when we have a confirmed um, sample that, that says we do have toxins present, then we do the warning. We swap out and have the yellow warning sign, which advises people, again, not to swim or water ski, not to drink the lake water, keep pets, livestock away. Um, we really recommend not eating the fish and then avoiding areas of scum. And then finally, for extreme cases, like we had last year with Summit Lake with very, very high anatoxin levels, um, we do close the lake, um, or actually ask Fish and Wildlife if they would close the boat launch. Uh, so that's, we have done that a few times. There are a couple of, the toxins generally affect either their nerve toxins, affecting their nervous system, or uh, liver toxins, and then some dermal skin toxins. If folks are interested in getting on our email alert list, we, we send out whenever we, um, we have a, a toxic bloom or if you, you know, live on the lake and you want to know just that we've gone and tested it, uh, you can get on our algae alert list. Or if you notice an algae bloom, again, you can call us at that number or that email address. It's also on our website, which you'll see in a couple slides later. Uh, the, also, Washington State, runs the, the toxic algae program. That's who pays for the, the sampling. Um, and their website, Northwest Toxic Algae, you can go and look statewide and see what, what, um, what's up with the lakes. So that's a great resource. But they've also got good links to both photos and more in-depth information about the toxins found in uh, toxic algae. So algae isn't the only thing going on in lakes. Um, we also do monitoring of swimming beaches. Uh, we, we monitor Burfoot County Park, which is saltwater in Bud Inlet, and then Kennedale County Park on Black Lake, which is freshwater. We uh, also have a county park, Fry Cove, out on Eld Inlet. We don't monitor it because um, state health is always monitoring the water in that area for shellfish. So when we know that the water quality is good enough for shellfish, we know it's good enough to go swimming in, so we don't use our resources for that. Um, in addition, there's uh, Priest Point Park and West Bay Park in, uh, in Bud Inlet, and they're not really swimming beaches, um, but they do get people using the recreation. You get you know, kids playing in the water and wading, and um, over at West Bay, you get people launching kayaks and stand-up paddle boards and all that. Uh, the last year, um, maybe the year before also, Surf Riders, which is a local nonprofit, teamed up with the, the state beach program and did monitoring there every other week. So we have some data for those areas too. And again, if we have any alerts, we do post that on our website. I, I know it's hard to read, um, <coughs> but that, that box up at the top will put any alerts. And then off on the side, 
Oh, it doesn't work there. Um, uh, the, the boxes on the side where it says hot topics and news and info and stuff, in there is a place you could sign up to get algae alerts. Okay, so in addition to that, we do shellfish biotoxin monitoring um, in coordination with the state health department. They, they coordinate that statewide. We collect uh, mussels out at Boston Harbor Marina um, and then state health and the tribes collect samples at other South Sound locations. They're, um, I, I think they grind them. I don't really know what they do. We, we just take a big bag of mussels off to their lab and they ship them off. But I think they mush them up and uh, test for biotoxins. So um, there's, there's several different kinds of biotoxins. Um, I may mispronounce them, but I'll give it a go. Amnesiac shellfish poisoning, that's the ASP. Diuretic shellfish poisoning, you can guess the uh, symptoms of that one. Yeah. And then a paralytic shellfish poisoning. And it, it is really important that folks, before they go out and sh harvest shellfish, do check the uh, biotoxin hotline, either on, on the website or by calling, uh, because the biotoxins, I, I, actually, it, it's another kind of toxic algae. Uh, it's just a, a saltwater toxic algae. They, they are mostly nerve toxins, and they can be deadly. The, the shellfish really filter them and, and um, kind of bioaccumulate them within the, the meat. And cooking does not destroy the, the toxins. Generally, cooking doesn't destroy, or heat does not destroy poisons. Uh, it does a good job on bacteria and viruses and stuff, but not poisons. So do call before or do... Check the website before you go out. The other kind of monitoring that we do is um, kind of responding to problems or emerging issues. Um, and I can give you some recent examples from, I think, all of these. Um, pollution complaints. Uh, so we had a situation where uh, uh, one of the Group B water systems, um, they were seeing rising nitrates in their, their well water. And we're concerned that maybe it was the uh, nearby horses or the nearby cows, and could we look into that? So that was kind of something that we investigated. Um, spills, we had a, a contractor um, mistakenly break a sewer line and, uh, in a nearby city um, and spilled about 5,000 gallons of sewage into a ditch. Uh, the cities are re really good at getting in there and getting it sucked up, but... Um, in this case, it was very close to a lake, so we wanted to just double check, and we were able to take samples and uh, confirm that there wasn't high levels of bacteria in the lake. Um, where we need to, to do further work for health alerts, we do that, and then special investigations. Again, uh, the Dobbs Creek and Fleming Creek area in Henderson Inlet, where our, our water quality stations out in the sound near those creeks are are wavering and are, are going downhill. So we're doing a real intensive look for about a um, year and a half, two years in that area to identify problems. So again, just in summary, we have a variety of types of monitoring that we do. Um, ambient, kind of ongoing streams and lakes monitoring, blue-green algae, uh, toxic, toxic algae monitoring, swimming beach, shellfish biotoxin, and investigative sampling. That's it. Any questions? Thomas, go ahead, Jane. Jay, I just want you to reiterate again that we don't know anywhere what causes toxic algae bloom. That is correct. It is being researched, as you can imagine, um, but we don't have any firm answers about what makes the algae become toxic. But we suspect, we suspect, we suspect. So if somebody says it's this issue, they're clearly wrong because we just don't know. And not just we here at Thurston County, we internationally don't know what causes it to go toxic, right? We don't know what makes it go toxic. That, that's right. We do have good ideas about what causes algae blooms, yes, excess, yeah, yeah. Er, excess nutrients, which could come from a whole variety of sources. Right. But what makes it. that algae then become toxic, we don't know. Got it. Thank you. I have no comments, questions. Absolutely professional, well done, as usual, and you and Art are the best. So. Yes, you are. Thank you. All righty, that moves us into item number eight, which is where um, board members can report back uh, what they've seen in the public, have a comment or some sort of involvement. Do you have anything you'd like to 
Uh, just I attended last week the uh, our BHO. Um, that's health related. Yeah, sure. The open house. Uh, <laughs> they're located now out at uh, the Lacey Hub next to Ricardo's. Uh, it's a lovely facility for all the work that they do. Uh, attended the uh, Together's uh, Healthy Futures Conference at Great Wolf Lodge. Wonderful, engaging speakers uh, on a variety of topics. Um, and then the, uh, the National Council of the NatCon 2018 Behavioral Health Annual Conference in D.C. Uh, and one of the highlights was, I mentioned I think last week, was the Modern Warrior Live about a soldier and blue jazz music put together to drive home the, the point that it's not just a disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, but there's also post-traumatic stress growth. Uh, it was very uplifting, powerful, but mm -hmm. exceedingly right. Uh, it just hits the emotions about veterans uh, coming home uh, uh, with injuries, uh, physical TBI and PTSD, and, and how, to get, how to get by that. Uh, and there is growth to come from that. Uh, and again, just to reiterate, this is a bicycle commuter month. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll take a stab at it. Um, I'm absolutely ecstatic. Uh, we as a county have moved from number seven to number six in our health ratings for, there's 39 counties, just to let you know, and we're number six. I think that's absolutely wonderful. Based on the leadership of Shelley Slaughter and those of the PHSS staff and every member there has pushed us forward one more notch and we're looking forward to going forward even more. But that's absolutely wonderful for the efforts we've done here to keep the county healthy. In addition to, today we received this here um, particular award. Um, um, TRPC and Thurston County were given the award of excellence of award for being on uh, the top five or the top as far as the climate action adaptation plan and our conservation um, and our comprehensive plan uh, speaks volumes to the um, other part of uh, staff, which is the community and economic development. The two go together as far as the health of the, of the county. And it's just remarkable the people who put their efforts into it and bring in the results of keeping this county healthy. Mm -hmm. So two awards right there, or two, two uh, accolades. Um, also, I uh, attended the, the NatCon conference in Washington, D.C. And while it's been said many times, the way I walked away from there, um, understanding what loneliness uh, does or doesn't do for an individual or a community, uh, you can eat all day long what you need to nourish your body and move forward and have that, that growth of what you need for your body and you need to fuel your body with water and what have you and you need those two things but you also need to do it, have that social connection with other people uh, to have that, that connection really is just as much as important as the other two entities of your, your life and your body to be able to, to thrive um, naturally and I thought oh my god we, need to, we just need to all talk together and, and be able to communicate with each other in some way or another and I think that's very good. Uh, also, the open house, uh, as Commissioner Hutchings mentioned with BHO, uh, he touched on it, but there's more. There was law enforcement there from uh, three different counties. There was mental health professionals of uh, every sort, non-mental uh, health and mental health professionals, um, and nonprofits, and that speaks volumes to, to uh, understanding the mental health uh, uh, issues that are going on here in the county, and um, we certainly were super happy to have that volume of people there to attend at the Thurston Mason Behavioral Health Organization. Uh, always working with the PIT, which is the point in time count. Um, some of the numbers that are out there, just to let you know, uh, is around 828 people. Um, it's, and that's a 43% increase from last year, of around 500-ish. I can't remember the exact number. But if you, got, you get involved with it, it's the third Thursday in uh, January. I invite anybody, even right now, to start thinking about getting involved. Because what it does is help us um, get an accuracy count and identify some, identify some of the resources we're looking to do and develop some measures to close that gap. And even though there's an increase, we're always trying to keep it even lower than possible. And so um, the PIT is super important, and I, I encourage people to get involved in what that means to the county. Uh, a couple others is the MRC, is the Medical Resource Corps. I, uh, uh, I attended, and along with Commissioner Edwards, the, um, um, it was a recognition night. And so... Um, they get together once a year to be able to recognize those who have done outstanding as far as the MRC. And this group of people, they're volunteers, but they do so much in terms of uh, giving back to the community. They're all retired uh, health professionals, and some of them are non-health professionals, but they help with the needle exchange. They help with vaccinations. They help with the floods. Just about any kind of health emergency, you'll find the, this group of people on the front line of um, being there to help. And they're absolutely wonderful. So to be there to give them that appreciation was uh, 
rewarding uh, in many different ways. And finally, um, we have here the um, Hazardous Weather Task Force. And this past uh, meeting, we were able to see how you put together uh, what they call a pallet house. It's just, as you can imagine, an air pallet. If you would load up a cargo plane, it's about that size. I think it was uh, 10 by 10, give or take a few feet. And just how you put the four walls up in the roof, but just how quick it is and how the comforts are for the climate. Uh, had heating, air, electricity in a very small way, but definitely um, to give dignity to those staying in there. It actually could house four if you put the bunk beds in there and a certain uh, configuration. But this is the kind of stuff that the housing, um, not the housing, I get that mixed up, the Hazardous Weather Task Force um, group, and it is a wonderful group, very energetic group. I invite you to come on that one also in, in the TAM. Uh, look at these kinds of uh, programs to be able to um, bring those out of the cold into a warm spot, and that's how we kind of define it, is to save lives. We're not into housing per se, although that can be a, a different subject that we absolutely love to talk about, but this is during the cold weather time frame, and uh, it, it worked wonderful during the code blue. We're just looking at alternatives, and so um, that's my, my spiel for the health portion, and I'll turn it over to the director and let her, have her speak a few words too. amazing public health staff um, and the presenters here today. We are celebrating Public Service Recognition Week here at Thurston County and just want to thank everyone in our department for their service and dedication. There's so much behind the scenes every day uh, that people in Thurston County and our department are doing to make Thurston County a great place to live, work, and play and carry out our mission at Thurston County Public Health and Social Services, which is working together to achieve the highest health and well-being for everyone. And I'm sorry that the nurses already um, had to leave for the day, um, but I really want to, to especially acknowledge their hard work. Our maternal child health nurses uh, help hundreds of women and children each year, and currently that program is nearing our maximum caseloads with all three counties that we serve. Yeah. We're really excited about the possibilities to further expand this program with new funding opportunities and also to meet the increasing needs both first-time mothers and those with multiple children who are experiencing greater levels of crisis and increasing mental health needs. Our nurses have the joys of making a difference in the lives of families and long-term health impacts on children, but they also sometimes have the heartache and grief that goes with their work when things don't go well, such as the death of a child when we're doing our child fatality death review or, or child fatality review, um, or a child born with disabilities that needs our ongoing support. We also have nurses who keep all of us safe through infectious disease control investigation. Last month, um, our nurses uh, investigated over 50 cases of infections and diseases ranging from sexually transmitted infections to foodborne illnesses to vaccine preventable diseases and other rare diseases that can really threaten the health of our entire community. They're really the unsung heroes who do the hard work every day on the front lines and a lot of people don't know that public health is always on call 24-7 mm -hmm. behind the scenes, ready to respond to any emergency. And our emergency preparedness is one of those teams that we have at our department, and they support our entire department and the community, uh, especially when we go into instant command, which we did have to activate last month uh, and are still currently in for our Summit Lake Toxic Algae, which you heard a little bit about through Jane's presentation, but I just wanted to, to reiterate that that Thurston County Public Health was notified of an algae bloom at Summit Lake on April 24th, and Dr. Wood issued a health advisory on April 27th. Um, we had samples taken that day and on the 30th, and we're continuing to test for that. Um, our toxin levels are currently 2.47 micrograms per liter, which is still at a dangerous level above, uh, above one. So um, this is the second consecutive week, so we will continue to to test on that um, until we have a result that's below um, dangerous levels. So warning signs were posted. You saw some of those in Jane's presentation um, at the public boat ramp and along the roads. Um, we communicated with the, with the public, sent an email to area residents, a news release was issued, um, and we posted warnings um, on our website, so if anyone would like to check that out. Um, we also have a constant contact email list that people can join to get regular updates. So that warning will remain in place um, until that bloom, su bloom, bloom subsides, and we have two consecutive weekly samples uh, below the action level. So Dr. Wood uh, advises uh, that people do not drink water 
from lake sources, from Summit Lake sources, not to bathe or wash dishes with water from the lake, and not to eat fish caught from the lake. Although boating and recreation on the lake is still permitted, just not water skiing. So Dr. Wood may have more to share in her report. Uh, I just, alongside our emergency preparedness uh, news, I just wanted to echo what Commissioner Blake said about the Thurston County Medical Reserve Corps, and I also attended their annual appreciation event last week. And um, they just um, are an amazing, amazing group of volunteers uh, that we depend on during a public health and health emergency or disaster. And I just wanted to um, highlight a few things that we're one of over a thousand nationally recognized medical reserve corps units. We have 104 active members. And we have uh, 20, 11 new volunteers that came, 14 volunteers uh, that are pending. Together, they have 536 years of volunteerism that wow. we learned about at that event. Um, each year, they do lots of things mm -hmm. um, in addition to constantly preparing and training in case the unthinkable happens. But they do other things, like um, they did three back-to-school vaccine clinics, three flu vaccine clinics. Uh, they gave a total of 418 vaccines. Um, they assist us in keeping our Thurston County Syringe Exchange Program operational. Um, and we had six uh, new volunteers that gave 78 hours of their time over two months. So um, I just wanted to echo those thanks uh, to them for that. Um, also at that event, uh, they did a really nice thing by putting together oh, um, some care packages for mm -hmm. our community's most vulnerable homeless citizens. Um, they've included hygiene supplies and um, health and safety things such as uh, condoms and toothbrushes and uh, hand sanitizer and bandages and things like that. Um, and those will be distributed to our service organization partners to support them. So we continue to work on that issue of homelessness with our local and regional government and nonprofit partners through the Thurston Thrives and our housing action team. The housing action team is one of eight action teams within Thurston Thrives with the goal to establish and implement community health improvement targets related to affordable housing and homelessness. The HAT, as it's called, works together to achieve goals on our strategy map in three key areas, and that's affordable housing and new construction, homelessness and crisis response and green and healthy homes, including safe and affordable rentals. And our healthy home staff at Thurston County Public Health leads the green team and is making great progress on multiple efforts within our action team to increase attention to healthy changes to rental housing in the community to improve the health of residents within those homes. They do not only home visits uh, to anyone in Thurston County, that needs uh, that needs them, but uh, they also do other training for um, our vendors and the public. So uh, we continue to also work on our opioid crisis. In addition to our homeless and affordable housing crisis, next month we will be launching our opioid task force, and um, we have many other efforts that we're engaged in with our regional Cascade Pacific Action Alliance and other partners. And Prosecutor John Thunheim, who was here earlier. Uh, will be joining me in leading our f our first meeting, which will be coming up soon. And doc I'll pass it over to Dr. Wood now in the interest of time. Thank you. you bet. Or unless, do you have any questions for me? Do you have any questions? I do not know. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Shelley. Uh, I wanted to say that I um, two of the programs that you heard about today have, have helped educate medical students and family medicine residents. I have the honor and privilege, thanks to you saying it's okay, um, uh, I get to train medical students and I get to train family medicine residents um, and my colleagues at the health department um, that help train them are the nurse family partnerships because they take um, the, those students and residents out on home visits and they know, okay, that's where I can refer this person who's come to me for prenatal care who has a lot uh, needs a lot of support. Um, uh, individuals uh, that I get to train have spent time at the syringe exchange program, and they made the comment that it, they had never felt, um, they never had uh, the human face of individuals caught in the opioid crisis, uh, because it's always usually adversarial uh, when seeking health care, and at the syringe exchange they got to see people um, and hear their stories, and they were deeply grateful. I also want to thank the environmental health staff who have uh, taken my uh, 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 colleagues uh, who are students and residents out um, to do restaurant inspections and also uh, well site inspections. 
Um, I had the uh, honor of serving as a delegate to the Washington Academy of Family Practice House of Delegates last uh, week. We, um, we uh, drove out to Spokane and um, talked about what we wanted to bring forward to the American Academy of Family Practice. There were two resolutions related to the opioid uh, crisis um, that uh, there was unanimous support for that. The uh, scientific assembly um, ha was mostly opioids, um, and I'll just read uh, overcoming barriers to safe and effective primary care pain management, team based opioid management, treating patients with opioid use disorder, why and how family physicians should lead. That was by Dr. Pontinosis, who is the physician with the healthcare authority. Um, uh, also, I have uh, the honor and privilege of interacting with many partners with regard to emergency preparedness and response, um, participated in a tabletop exercise run by the Washington State Department of Health two weeks ago. Uh, we still cannot forget that we may have uh, unlikely Ebola, but other special pathogens and can rural hospitals treat those people or how are we going to transport and it's a collaboration between many agencies to get those individuals uh, transported safely to Harborview. Uh, also just this morning I was at a cross-jurisdictional collaboration project with the American Indian Health Commission um, and we had a tabletop where there was bubonic plague that showed up at the paddle. Mm -hmm. You know, two years ago we had the paddle to Nisqually. Um, the tribes get together on a regular basis and what if we had some infectious disease that was spreading rapidly um, with our tribal partners who are sovereign nations in their own right, so working things out like that. Also um, had the privilege of uh, attending um, a focus group. Uh, we always worry about access to resources in emergency preparedness, such as there are 10 people who need the ventilator in a pandemic and there's only four ventilators. Yeah. So uh, the Washington State Department of Health and others have worked to have uh, focus groups with members of the community saying, well, how do you, how do you place value on uh, human life, a seven-year-old versus a 60-year-old uh, versus a teacher versus, you know, and it was fascinating um, to hear the conversations around the table. And um, I, I could keep going, but I'll stop there and ask and see if you all have any sure. questions. Any questions, comments, to the doctor? No, but they've made movies about that on that premise. Who do you save? Who do you help? You know, <laughs> right. you sacrifice. <laughs> That's a terrible dilemma. It, it, it is. Like Sophie's Choice. I mean, it's terrible. Yeah. Terrible dilemma. It's an ethical dilemma. Really? And that's what we, why we want, uh, the, and the state is working to get public impact, because how, how do people decide who gets those resources? Yeah. Oh, boy. That's it. That's real good. <laughs> Romero, do you have anything? Lydia, anything? Shelley, anybody last one? Okay. But that gets us to the point on our agenda uh, for adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn the Board of Health uh, meeting of May 8, 2018. Second. It's been moved and second to adjourn. We are adjourned.